You're listening to the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Podcast, Episode 24. This episode, I'm speaking with man of many hats, Dan O'Neill. Dan's thirst for adventure and the natural world has taken him to some of the most remote places left on Earth. From the Mayan temples of the Yucatan and ancient civilizations of Southeast Asia to the mountains of North Africa and the deepest parts of the Amazon rainforest. His background as a field biologist has equipped him with the extensive knowledge of rainforest biodiversity and survival skills, particularly in the Neotropics. In 2019, he was part of a seven-person expedition to the headwaters of one of Guyana's most remote rivers, the Rua, in search of wild animals that had never seen people before. He made video diaries and presented the journey, culminating with the filming of a wild rainforest jaguar on the expedition's final day. After reading an article about the last surviving giant Yangtze softshell turtles, Dan travelled extensively through Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia and Thailand on a motorbike researching the illegal wildlife trade, specifically of freshwater turtles. He returned to Vietnam in September 2019 in search of the critically endangered cat Belanga, with anti-poachers fighting on the front lines. Through visiting the wet markets of Southeast Asia, hawk and falcon markets in Morocco, and shark finning stalls in South America, he has developed an international understanding of how the wildlife trades affects local people, conservation, and its connection to areas of conflict. Most recently, he traveled to the rebel-occupied Red Zone of Western Mindanao to learn the conservation story of the most endangered raptor on the planet, the Philippine Eagle. These experiences have led Dan to begin his PhD research at the University of Sheffield on the global impacts of war on wildlife conservation. Dan is a graduate of the prestigious master's course in wildlife filmmaking at the University of the West of England, partnered with the BBC Natural History Unit. For his final project, he organised an expedition into the remote rainforests of Guyana, using his experience to realise a woman's lifelong dream of seeing the formidable harpy eagle in the wild. The film To Find a Harpy has since been selected by 20 film festivals, screening to audiences all over the world. With conservation dreams in mind, Dan created the Wilderland Film Festival, the UK's first ever touring wildlife film festival. Alongside the festival, the Wilderland TV YouTube channel has already gained thousands of subscribers and continues to share independent wildlife films from around the world. Dan also discusses his latest film, Queen of Birds, and how he produced and developed the story for film. Dan, hey, thanks so much for joining us on the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. Cheers, Jake. It's nice to see you again. As you know, the point of this podcast is to help aspiring wildlife filmmakers with their career choices, show people how, you know, how people like yourself broke into the industry and kind of, you know, the struggles and, and the successes you've had along the way. So I just want to start off by asking you, how did you get into wildlife filmmaking? I feel like this is one of those things where everybody always has their own kind of random road into it. Um, but like many people in uh, Natural History TV, I studied uh, zoology or biology at university. Um, and then from there worked out, not in a film capacity, but uh, as a research biologist in quite remote areas in, the Mex in Mexico, um, parts of the Amazon uh, and in Southeast Asia. And that kind of then transitioned, because I love photography, um, but had never really done video. And then because obviously you're seeing, it really started in Guyana, which is the country I've been going to for seven years now. Um, it's a real lost world, an Arthur Conan Doyle kind of novel situation there where, um, you know, it feels like you've been stepped through a portal back in time to where animals just take over the entire place. It's 85% primary rainforest the country, beautiful, beautiful location. 95% um, of the population lives on that small coastal strip um, on, on the sea, and then the rest of the, the small population of indigenous people that lives in the interior. 
Um, and it's just this beautiful, beautiful place. And while I was out there, I was um, just, I was working on a long-term species diversity study where we were catching bats and birds and reptiles and amphibians and, and camera trapping for mammals. Uh, and there was just so much amazing stuff there that I started to use my camera to record little clips. And they actually asked me on that expedition, well, could you make us a little video? And that was kind of the first time I'd made something in a natural history capacity. Um, and then went back to university because I'd done that in one of my summers and started working uh, for their, um, uh, the university TV station as a presenter. And it all kind of just merged together. Then went back out on these expeditions and it was a real, that was my purpose then. I was like, I'm gonna make this video stuff what I primarily do and did a bit of video journalism. And then through that, um, decided to do my first ever solo project. And I went out and drove around on a little, beaten up motorbike in Southeast Asia uh, to learn about the illegal wildlife trade, specifically of freshwater turtles, because they have huge numbers of them in Vietnam species, but obviously the abundance is so low. Um, and the largest freshwater turtle in the world, the Yangtze giant soft softshell turtle, of which there is only now two individuals left on earth. Um, there are two or three individuals left on earth, and it's functionally extinct because they're all over 100 years old, because um, they'd eaten them to extinction, basically. Um, and so, on that expedition, I applied for a master's here in Bristol, um, partnered with the BBC Natural History Unit. And for whatever reason, they, uh, they let me on. I remember having my final interview. I was sat in some very dirty hostel in Cambodia uh, and I'd ran down the street because I was already late and I got a, like a beaten up old dirty um, street stall shirt. And I was sat there with just underwear and this shirt on trying to be really posh and clever with this right. uh, you know, against a white wall. Um, but yeah, they let me on and that was amazing. And that kind of started it all for me because that just gave, you, gave us so much. You know, we learned risk assessments. We learned how to, you know, tell a story, how to edit our own stories, how to shoot for the edit and all of that different process. And then made a film during the masters um, that then was shown to the BBC National History Unit and other production companies here in Bristol. That's fantastic. And so, you, and, and having that insight is so powerful because I think, you know, what so many people see of TV is it looks so simple so much of the time, you know, this image being played back to you in a story format, it doesn't really, you know, you don't see everything that goes on behind the, 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 mm -hmm. the, the curtains, as it were. And when you learn that stuff, you learn how much of it happens way before filming ever begins, all that pre-production. Mm -hmm. And that's just vital to making a good show. So it sounds like you really went from, you know, being a scientist, a biologist, and then seeing the power of TV. Is that kind of what the, the draw was to continuing doing the filming? Massively. I mean, because I, I feel like everybody has this kind of rose tinted idea of science where you, you go into it wanting to change the world or wanting to make some massive impact on, um, on conservation. But really, you know, science communication, filmmaking has such a capacity to do that. You can go and find these stories. And if you have that kind of ability to marry, you know, what the scientist is truly trying to say with you know, something that is factual entertainment, you know, entertainment is a very large part of it. Um, you can get that to a wide, as what massive audiences, and we, massive, and we saw that with Blue Planet 2's digital campaign with plastic pollution. You know, plastic pollution isn't typically something that, you know, could widely engage an audience, but coupling it with, you know, these incredible, beautiful cinematic shots against, you know, Tom York, Radiohead's music. It's like, it's really inspiring how, how film can, you know, change perceptions. And I think that's why I was really interested in doing it in the first place. Um, yeah, and also we can. We're lucky as like, you're the same with Reconnecting Wild, your amazing film. Just the power of even independent filmmaking to make you know small changes. With Queen of Birds, my recent film, um, we raised uh, quite a lot, quite a bit, nearly ten thousand dollars for um, Philippine eagle conservation just through an independent film and got a forest protected. And I think that's what's really exciting about it. Yeah, I mean that's amazing. That is uh, incredible. The power that, as you say, so many scientists. My wife uh, has a PhD. She studied for years and years and years, you know, her PhD took seven years in the US because it was on mountain lions and, you know, wow. trying to find your subjects up in the mountains takes time. Um, but it's one of those things, as you say, you go into science with that kind of rose tinted view that you're going to make a change. You, you know, everyone's going to see your science. Everyone's going to be wowed by it. Your papers are going to be out there. You're published. And then as Rick Rosenthal on, the, on his episode of the show said, you know, about 12 people saw his papers. Yeah. But a billion people have seen his, his TV programs. And mm -hmm. however you look at that, 
if it's awareness and impact you're trying to create, then certainly film has that capacity. So mm. talking about your, your latest film, Queen of Birds. Now, this is a, a film you filmed just before lockdown. Yeah. And then I think you went into lockdown, uh, uh, in, into the edit phase of that. How did lockdown actually affect the production or was it kind of seamless? Had you finished it perfectly before lockdown started? So that's, that's actually really interesting because we, we had two shoots planned. So the first shoot, um, we were going to go out for two weeks and then we were going to go back and do uh, this big old release project. We were going to go and do loads of extra stuff a few weeks later. Um, and, you know, serendipitously, we got there and had a, I mean, I don't know if you've seen the film, but we have this uh, horrible situation that happens at the beginning. So we arrive in the Philippines and we've come to follow the story of this one individual uh, Philippine eagle, which is um, the most critically endangered large raptor in the world. There's less than 400 pairs left on earth uh, that are breeding in the wild and almost the entire captive population for which the only breeding program is, exists in the entire world is in this tiny sort of one mile squared um, plot 31 Philippine eagles and it's so you know at risk of things like avian influenza um, they could catch as aspergillosis fungal infections um, so many different sorts of things that can happen um, so this is a really critically endangered bird and one bird flew out to sea there were no thermals and she plummeted right into the ocean probably driven out by another pair of Philippine eagles in their territory and she was miraculously rescued by these two Filipino fishermen who one of their fathers was a rescue an animal rescuer and so he had that sort of in his body, which was like, I need to rescue this amazing animal. Um, and he took the bird and they didn't know what to do with it. So they tethered, tethered her to uh, a tree on the beach and they named her Marcim after the location that they found her. And then she went on this crazy journey being in the, tethered in the back yard of a, um, of a local politician um, who we later met in the film and heard the, her story. Uh, and she'd had rocks thrown at her by children who were scared of her, because it's a very big bird. It's one of the largest eagles on the planet, if not the tallest eagle on the planet. Yeah. And then uh, eventually back to the Philippine Eagle Foundation. But unfortunately, due to all of her, all of the massive amounts of stress that had happened, she succumbed, she succumbed to her, um, you know, the stress and aspergillosis, that fungal infection got into her lungs. And with, and it's real bad for eagles, that one. It really can, it, and birds of prey, um, as one of the interesting things about them is they will, uh, they won't present illness um, they, because it shows weakness. And so they will, won't present it at all until it's the last 24 hours and they will just deteriorate. And that's what happened to her. And as I landed in uh, Manila airport, uh, with Ben, the camera operator, we got the call from Jason Ibanez, the director of research and conservation. He said, yeah, she's, she's gonna die. So our central character for this entire film was on her last legs. And so we then, and you were just mentioning about how, you know, storyboarding is so important. And we had this whole plan, this whole storyboard, everything. And it just was like thrown to the wind. And we were like, well, we're here now. We need to make the very best story that we can make out of this bird. Um, and we went and met Ma'asim and they let us meet her on her last night. And then we made the film very much about the area that she was due to be released to was an unprotected forest. And everyone was so excited about getting her out there that our, our mission was then to see if we could get that forest protected in the legacy of this bird that would have been sent there so that a new bird will have a, a, a future habitat to exist in. And a lot of other stuff happened, in, including in a, um, an expedition into the political red zone where um, uh, the rebels are active to see if we could find a wild Philippine eagle ourselves. But you have to watch the film to see if we did. Absolutely. I mean, that sounds amazing. And, you know, what? I mean, this, this just goes to show how in filmmaking, you know, when production just like kind of halts like that and you have to start looking, going back to your story and, and working out, you know, how is this story going to develop from now? You know, that I think happens so much of the time. And of course, we never see that again as the viewer. We see this polished, finished story that everyone thinks, well, this is this is how it was meant to be. But uh, tell me, how did you find that story? This is one of the questions I get asked probably more than anything um, is it's certainly about pre-production, is how you find a story like that. What, what was it that uh, drew you to that story? How, how did you get introduced to that story in the first place? 
Well, um, so that's another thing about being like trying to remain an active member of the scientific community for me is so important because we all get into this for our own reasons. And for me, I just love adventure. I love wildlife and I'm obsessed with these amazing, wicked new stories and new rare animals. Um, I had this kind of thing that I've been doing. I still am kind of doing it in a bit. I'll tell you what we're off to go and do soon. But it's kind of this idea of being a good, like the, the trophy hunter, but in a you know for conservation in a way because I love to go and it's all about the expedition for me almost it's all about the hunt but then at the end it's about the we got it we've got this shot and it's about filming it for me um but I've because of keeping in touch with all the scientific community in search of these stories my friend Jimmy Hill who runs Raptor Aid which is a British ornithological society um he introduced me to Jason Ibanez and I was off to go to a wedding in India um and see tigers and I was very excited but because I'd got to London and Jason Jason was in London for this very short period of time. We just crossed over for what was two hours in a coffee shop. And he told me all of this stuff. He gave me a little tiny Philippine eagle doll made by one of the indigenous women nearby one of the areas where they exist and said, you must come. We have this story about Maseem and she's just been rescued and showed me video of her, uh, which is the archive that you can see in the film of her being held on the beach by this guy. Um, and that's kind of where it all, um, it all started. As well as that, I mean, eagles, I'm a massive, uh, I have a massive affinity for birds of prey, primarily because when I was a kid, I I, um, I trained a, a, a Harris hawk um, and had my own hawk for for many years until I went to university. So there's that affinity with raptors and birds of prey that I'm always kind of I'm, I guess I'm more alert for that when I hear about that kind of story. Yeah, that's fantastic. Did did you uh, when you were raising your Harris hawk, would you have it in your in your uh, in your house on a perch at night was it one of those kind of relationships? I I also did. I grew up on a wildlife park on a wildlife sanctuary, and um, and, and I I flew um, buzzards, European buzzards, uh, barn owls, and uh, European eagle owls. And oh, I had really? An eagle owl that I would bring home with me on a perch, and uh, she would just sit beside the bed with me at night and she'd just sit on her perch. Amazing. And, uh, and I would, so she would travel with me everywhere in the van on one of those arch perches. And uh, yeah, it was an incredible relationship we had. And That's so, beautiful. so yes, I, I understand the, the, the falconry side of it um, and your affinity with birds. Um, getting back into that, I mean, this is, um, this, is, this is fascinating stuff. And I know that our listeners love hearing how these stories come together so you were jimmy gave you this story basically said hey, hey this is what's happening we've rescued this bird it's out in the philippines now at that point you know you have this idea of a story right you, you don't know where it's going to lead or what's going to happen with it what do you do next because you know funding is obviously you know one of the biggest problems that everybody has how you fund a trip out there where are you getting your gear from? What's it, how are you going to develop this story? All of that. No, yeah, you know, it's a small question. <laughs> but no, it's also funny because um, I went through a crazy pitching stage where I was like, right, this has to be made. And I only had two months until I had to go out there and that's, that's when it was all going to happen. So I was going around to BBC people and I was like, this, this, this. And people are like, oh, I don't know, audiences, do they always connect with birds? And I'm like, this bird's really cool. It's the only bird of prey on the planet that has blue eyes. It's got a giant mullet. It looks like David Bowie. Come on, let's go and find the bird. Um, and they were, and, and, and it was tough to get it commissioned. And also another thing was, I was like, I'm going to go and find one in the wild. And they're like, nah, I don't think you'll ever find it. So I wrote up a, um, a pitch for a series in featuring this uh, character and um, and uh, it didn't get picked up you know as is the case with many ideas hundreds of ideas almost 99.99999% of ideas and I was like you know what I'm gonna go and I'm gonna do it anyway and I spent my savings to go and make the film and I, I shoot on an, I have my because I, I make do a lot of brand films and other films I have a, an F7 and I shoot with my own gear which is so freeing I mean if you can have Gear. it's the most freeing thing it doesn't need to be an f7 i mean i i have an a7 III, which is a i think even almost better than the f7 in many ways it's a tiny little compact camera it looks like just a little point and shoot but it actually shoots in 4k has um beautiful color it's a fantastic full frame camera um but uh yeah and i went out to make this film and i do deals with brands so when i go out i uh, i ambassador for a company called avalon optics it's a binoculars company but also rohan clothing uh and i'll make uh take pictures wearing the clothes and i'll use the binoculars and then i'll make a film alongside those uh projects for those companies so although i don't get it up front i make the film when i come back with the rushes uh and 
uh, they get to have a relatively cheap internationally made film featuring a very charismatic animal that I was otherwise going to do and it just gets accrues back some of the costs um, and then also from rushes I'll then take those rushes and pitch them in a different format to another place so a perfect example of that was my expedition in 2019 to find a jaguar um, and then I versioned and sold those rushes for a six-month period to Barcroft Studios um, where they got to have that film and now uh, because it was a six-month exclusivity I have those rushes again now and I can continue to use them but Barcroft got their film out of that that then went up on their website so it's kind of like diversifying the uh, revenue stream and how you actually use rushes because you know one thing that I find from my situation is the background that I have from remote area science and research stuff and camp management that's that's quite novel and new and it's quite difficult to get those shots a lot of the time so if I go out there I know that there is I mean, doing work in TV as well, I know that there is a value to, you know, a shot of a harpy eagle. Uh, if you can get a shot of a harpy at a nest, bringing in, bring in a howler monkey, that has more value than just what you're doing it for in that time. So owning, so retaining ownership of your rushes, if you, if you shoot in 4K especially, is something I think is really important. That's such a valuable piece of advice. That's exactly what I do with most of the independent films that I make. You know, typically with Reconnecting Wild, we did the same thing. We retained all of the rights to the footage. The film is owned by the, uh, by the, the client. Um, in its whole state, but it can't be used in any other way. And I think it's so valuable because what it does, it allows us as filmmakers to be able to make films for nonprofits who just don't have the budgets that it would typically take to make them. Yeah. But then on the back end, you can take that footage and then use it and sell it as stock footage after that. I think, you know, what you've touched upon there, Dan, is that it's, it's a bit like being an entrepreneur, you know, up front and foremost before being a filmmaker. You know, mm. it sounds like you, you have the, the tactics, if you like, to go out there and just think about, okay, you know, the passion to why do I want to make this film and how am I going to make it work? Mm. There are so many people I speak to who, you know, sadly have this, uh, you know, illusion that someone's going to come along to them because they have a camera and ask them to make a film. And it's so rare that that happens unless you're established in the industry, you know, just because you have a good idea. Like you said, I think it is, you know, 1% or as you said, I think yeah. a 0.01% of ideas yeah. that get taken up from pitch phase through to development. Everything mm. else just goes by the wayside. And so um, it's a great, it's a great way to do it. So in terms of uh, looking at that and the way that you are funding some of your independent projects like that, how, is, how do you think that's helped you in the industry as a whole? I mean, by going out and taking, having the initiative to go and find your own funding in that way or ways to fund it and get some of the expenses back, how, how do you think that's helped you in the industry to put you where you are now in terms of you know, your career path? I mean, hugely valuable. Um, what the skills that I learned on the masters that I don't think you could not, you couldn't learn outside of it. I mean, uh, there's a guy who uh, is now a, a member of the BBC Natural History Unit. Um, actually, both both of them, Annie Moyer and Isaac Rice, they do uh, they do digital for BBC, uh, and they did my course with me. And they, um, you know, they went in and they and and, and Isaac especially learned so much of the skills that he already had. He came to the masters with them because he taught himself on YouTube. And I think the number one thing that I would say I learned that I've taken that most value from is editing. You know, being able to edit is it just transforms what you're doing is just this kind of like, I'm making an image to creating a story. Um, but in terms of what you're saying there about going out and doing it on my own, I think it definitely ma makes you a more competitive person in terms of uh, being able to understand so many different things and being T-shaped in a role. Because with you know budgets going down for shows, with crews going out with fewer people on them, you know they're far more likely to hire somebody for a production that not only understands how to shoot a camera or if they're even a researcher to have B shoot a camera but also to understand the edit and understand that there maybe there's a couple of shots that are really going to help in that interview a bit of b-roll that's going to help over here I think by doing it all yourself and training yourself over long periods of time it just means that you you become so much more reactive and you understand how things uh, and, and how things might change and how you can deal with those uh, those changes and people people love t-shaped people in the industry now um, it's def because you re researcher is often your director camera operator as well. Right. And no, I, I completely agree. I mean, from the days when we were running around uh, making shows with National Geographic, one of the things that we found was when we took 
say a PA on a production assistant, you wanted someone who not only had the passion just to be there and want to be involved, but who did have the understanding they could jump in and do multiple roles. And I think so many of the guests we've had on the podcast say the same thing. It's far more, you know, it's far, far better to have someone who's ready to jump into different roles and someone who's going to be like, no, I'm a sound operator. That is all I do. I'm not touching any other piece of equipment apart from the sound boom, you know, that makes life hard, it makes life really hard on a production shoot. It did back then. And, and certainly I can see how it does now. Um, so you were talking about gear. You've got an FS7. I shoot on an FS7 as well. I also shoot on the A7S and uh, mm -hmm. Sony, Sony just recently loaned me the A7S uh, III, which I oh. took down. It's an oh. astonishing camera. Astonishing. Can they send it to me too, please? That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, I think now it's it's about to be shipped. I think they're about shipping now. Um, they're, what an astonishing camera. I know the A7 III is very, very similar, higher resolution. In terms of, you know, these are, these are fantastic cameras. They're cheap for what they are. I mean, the images are astounding. The nice thing about those two cameras is they match very, very well, so you can use them as A and B cameras. But in, in terms of a bit of advice about gear, you know, gear is probably the, uh, you know, there's the kind of how do you get your stories question and what gear should I use question. Those are the two biggest questions that people have. Um, you know, one of the things I always tell people is it's really not about the gear, right? You have to know how to, how to shoot a story and you could do that literally on your iPhone. Something else you mentioned was behavioral shots like the harpy, uh, mm. you know, grabbing a monkey. It's, it's one of those things that in this day and age, there are stock websites everywhere with all sorts of footage on. And it looks like stock footage is worthless these days, you know, 60 bucks a clip. And it's mm. just not true. It's the, just the fact that we have to be able to get good behavioral footage to make it worth something. So in terms of advice about gear, um, you know, what, what advice do you have? Because not everyone has 10 grand to run out and buy an FS7 or 10,000 US dollars to, uh, you know, buy that and then, sorry, three and a half thousand for, say, an A7. Um, what advice do you have in terms of that in this day and age? Um, so, as you said, I think well, the first one, I'll do it in two points. The first one, using your phone, massive one. I mean, phones are amazing. They've shot entire Hollywood movies on a phone and you can get little clip-on things that will change your phone's um, uh, kind of... Uh, lens on it and it can make bokka, it can do loads of different things. Um, there's a guy who I know um, called Nico Eguren, who is a development, he works in development at the BBC Natural History Unit. And on his weekends, he goes away and there's these adventures um, uh, just to Cornwall, the coastline, he'll go to somewhere, but while he's there, he'll make a video on his phone. So he'll film loads of, li loads of different shots and he'll have a track in his mind that he kind of wants to make a music video to. And he'll make a story of the, the entire weekend he's gone on. And that's just something that he puts on the internet for himself but is also an amazing editing and you know uh it's, it's a perfectly contained really nice little adventure story that he's created for his phone using editing software um and they're really very very good um uh and i think that's a really good one i think it's really important to just like use what you have if you don't have the money to get a camera right now you can make really cool stuff and start honing your craft with editing using your phone on the other side i think getting a camera can actually be a really great uh, incentive for you to gut start making your own really good stuff because I do think that editing uh, while it can be learned is also really instinctive like if you have a flair for editing you could make something really good very quickly a good example of that is when I go out to Guyana there is um I go out with a bunch of my friends uh, and one of them is an indigenous kid he's 19 years old um, he's called Shannon and he um, he did not edit or shoot and when I was going out there I gave him a copy of um, Final Cut Pro um, and we were just like spent, and we were out there for like six weeks and they had no one around us except for my laptop, the cameras and stuff. And he would film and then we would edit in the evenings and he instantly became amazing, much better than me. Like he's a very, he's got a really good eye for it. Um, and I think that's what was really exciting for him was using these cameras. It's suddenly he saw this, he was using the A7 and he saw it and he's like, wow, this is really cool, especially having a a prime lens on it because it's like so cinematic and you're like wow this is oh my god I can't believe I'm able to create this and I think that then can in turn make you more inspired to carry on doing it and to shoot more with it and to learn how to do it more uh, and for those ones I would say a brilliant one is just get one of those as you were saying a full frame with with a cheap like you can get a 35 mil prime lens on Sony mount for I think it's like 270 quid um pounds uh but yeah no there's a there's a whole load of different cameras out there and I think it's just a case of getting it 
And also, you know, another thing was when I was buying my first camera, when I was at university, um, my first proper DSLR camera, I just made decisions. Like I didn't go and buy that thing that I didn't need to buy. And it, it, you, you not believe how quickly money can accrue if you stop doing certain things. So I, there's that too. Yeah, and I think it, you know, it's so, it's so valid because the fact is, you know, we get, I call it gear envy. You know, you, you see what other people are shooting on. You know, people hear you're on an FS7, they go, I've got to have an FS7. You know, how am I going to make that happen? And that becomes their focus rather mm -hmm. than, you know, having the passion to get out there and just film a story, film something. And I, I like what you're saying about using the phone. And then, you know, if you buy a camera, it's just incredible what you can get. What I find is it's also, it gets so much easier. It's harder to learn the gear, but once you've got it down, the difference is if you're running around filming with a phone and you get close-ups and far, you know, wides and what have you with a phone, once you get a camcorder with a zoom lens, like a 20 times zoom lens, or you start using zooms on a, 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 on a DSLR or whatever camera it might be, you suddenly realize, you know, you can now, you know, so kind of sit back a bit more and really think about those shots and not have to run around quite so much. And it, it's almost like you've learned the fundamentals. Now you can put it into practice with better gear. And I think mm. that's just such a huge lesson to learn. Massively. On what you were just saying about the FS7, if people are watching, I actually prefer the A7 III to the FS7, which is a fraction of the cost. So please do not, if, you, if you're just buying a camera, don't get an FS7. Um, but another one is the uh, new ND filters, neutral density filters, is massive. If you want to get those beautiful cinematic shots on a little full frame camera, or even not on a full frame camera, um, with a prime lens, uh, getting an, an, a variable ND at the front of it, it's not expensive and it will massively transform the experience of being able to shoot outside. Absolutely, absolutely. No, and you know, I kind of agree with you. I love the image that comes out. I have the A7S Mark One and Mark Two, and both of them are astonishing cameras. The image mm. still blows me away. The, the Mark One is uh, 1080, uh, it does 4K externally, but that 1080 image is, is incredible. It's really, you know, we use an Atomos with it now to get the 4K purely, you know, so that we, we have the uh, ability to, to, to use that and for archive, um, uh, you know, as well. But um, the, the image is astonishing. So as you say, and that camera you can pick up now for about $500, yeah. uh, five or 600 US dollars. It's, it's crazy. So uh, certainly there's nothing holding people back for good cameras now. And the DH5 as well, another one. I would yes. always say the DH5 is just like, it's a, it's a, a, a run and gun stream. Amazing Absolutely. image stabilization. Yeah, smaller sensor, and I, a lot of people are put off by the smallest, because it's micro four thirds, I think. They get put off by it, but they, you look at the image and there's nothing to be put off by. It's an incredible yeah. image, so. And a macro actually helps you out. If you're shooting mac, mac, little tiny things, that four thirds sensor can be a, a positive instead of a negative. Absolutely, there you go. So, okay, going back, I want to go back to, um, you were talking about some of the issues, like when you were filming, um, uh, the uh, Queen of Birds and the whole storyline changes. Just going back to kind of issues like that, you know, one of the big part of this podcast is about struggles and kind of the struggles that you have faced as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. What would you say, you know, are some of the biggest struggles you've had and are still having? You know, it doesn't matter, I think, where we are in our career paths, right? Struggles are just there with every production and just in life in general. So, you know, what, kind of, what are some of the biggest struggles you've had um, throughout? Um, I think partly because I, I have several kind of hats. Um, but, um, so the filmmaking one, I would say uh, biggest struggle is always just getting the funding because sometimes you can, the, the dangly carrot someone puts out and says that, oh, I might give you the funding, ends up not being the funding. And I think with all of these things, the ones I'm going to say after this as well, the most important thing is just have resilience and to keep, keep plugging away because, and to be able to spin lots of plates because you're going to drop a lot of those plates, but one of them is going to stick. Um, and uh, yeah, and the other one is a, as a presenter because I do presenting work as well. Um, and a, a, one thing that I've dealt with the problems of not being able to get things that, from that capacity is to do them myself. Um, but uh, that one's, yeah, presenting is a tough one. And it's, you know, it, it's because when you're a camera operator, it's very technical and it's very artistic and it's very, um, you know, it's, it's, it's that side of the brain. Whereas presenting is kind of, it's about you. And so it sometimes can feel a bit like, I can't do it or this and that, you know? And I think you need to have so many different kinds of resilience in this industry because it is very tough. And, and, and it's very rarely, if never, personal. Um, but you just have to kind of, you have to 
get up, dust yourself off and carry on. And actually, from my perspective, I was taken on as a client um, by um, my amazing, incredible agent, Joe Sarsby, who is just a dream. Um, and uh, she took a chance on me after seeing some stuff of me in the Amazon. And, you know, she was very blunt with me. She, she's also Liz Bonin's agent, um, who is a big presenter here in the UK. Um, a fantastic person, did, um, uh, did Drowning in Plastic, a really uh, hard-hitting but amazing documentary. And she was saying that um, with Liz, you know, it took a long time to get her off the ground. Um, and for me, you know, it's been a couple of years, but now things are starting to, to happen now, which is really, really exciting. And I think it's just... Plug, 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 plug away, because um, you uh, you have to remember that just like every job, you don't start and then you're suddenly, you know, gonna, everything's going to come in, come and hit you exactly the way you want it to happen and you're going to be there in five minutes. You start at the bottom and you always have to work your way up. And I think that's the case with everything, including all angles of wildlife filmmaking. So, yeah, that would be my advice there. Yeah, I think that's so valid, um, you know, in this day and age especially, you know, success is something that, that takes time to build. And I think one of the one of the areas that today where it's it, there's this gray area area is social media and pretty much everything you see on social media is success when you're following your you know your peers and the, the you know your um people who you aspire to be like um you just see the successes you don't you know we're not typically posting pictures of failures <laughs> on in our sweatpants on the sofa going <laughs> right exactly so and and it creates that kind of you know when am i going to be successful but really if you're sat there just looking at instagram or watching youtube videos and not out there doing it certainly in this industry it's not going to happen you have to be proactive out there you know building it and making it happen and mm. so i think that that's so valid in this day and age because it can be hard hard to see the woods for the trees massively and one thing completely on that note is it we always say it's a really competitive industry to get into i think there's two things there in that one it is competitive but at the same time if you are right for it and you absolutely love it it will happen that's the first one and i say that when i, I do talk sometimes at unis because people who are really into it always come back in a year's time you're like ah yeah, I knew you would. Um, and then uh, the other one is, it's so competitive, but I would say that's it's really important to remember that you need to be competitive with yourself and not with other people, um, because that will just spin you out and put you into a place that you don't want to be. And you always want to be collaborative. And if you can help somebody else out, that's really great. And you want to be someone that helps someone else. You don't want to be somebody that, you know, um, people don't want to help out. That's another Absolutely. one. Absolutely. And I think that that's really the key, the collaboration. It's all of TV, the <clears throat> making TV productions for whatever industry is about collaboration. And it's teamwork. It's never about an I, you know, me doing this, me doing that. And, um, and that's so important. That goes back to, yeah, being part of a small crew. As you say, crews are getting much smaller. When I was uh, out and about making shows with National Geographic, we had anywhere from the, at some point there was myself as a presenter and then we had uh, our director cameraman. So there'd be two of us and we would, we spent three weeks in the Northwest Territories up in the middle of nowhere, you know, um, right up to a crew of 13 people traveling around. And it didn't matter, you know, when there's two of you, you do obviously, you know, way more than you would just as a presenter. And, um, you know, if there's 13 of you, you just jump in, you do your role and you're ready to take over and help wherever. And that's, that's so, it's so valuable that advice because it's the same wherever you are. Mm. Um, so now it, it's interesting. You brought up one, and we've not actually spoken about management in any way on this podcast before. And I think it's really uh, it'd be really worth talking and kind of looking into how management is working for you. So in terms of being with the Joe Sarsby um, agency, now Joe Sarsby, the management uh, company, Joe and her company, which is called the Joe Sarsby Management, I believe, isn't it? Um, is very much about presenters for documentary national uh, natural history TV. And so she's very unique from that perspective of, mm -hmm. of really just taking on factual TV uh, presenters and filmmakers. What do you see the role of management for you particularly in terms of how is the, the having a manager going to help you with your career? Um, well, so interestingly, I went to Wildscreen in 2018 and I had just started my company, Wilderland, uh, which is how we met. And um, I, I was thinking, I love this company and I'm aware of my own faults and what I'm better at and what I'm worse at. And one thing that I'm, you know, I'm less good at is kind of that 
organizing the tour, getting the location, sorting all of that stuff out. And also in some respects, finding the money because I'm not a very, I'm not, I'm not great at being like, you need to pay me this amount of money. I can't do it. I, I'm very British with that. It's like, no, 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 I'll, I'll take what I deserve. Um, but Joe's great at that. And you know, I think that's where it's a really good collaboration. And I met her at Wild Screen and this was long before the presenting thing had happened. And I basically, I met her actually she was walking out of a building and I just was like, gonna do it, gonna do it. Walked up and I was like, hello, I know who you are. I'm gonna pitch you my thing. And she dragged me across the, um, the tent. She brought me over, sat me down in a restaurant and went, go on then, and uh, pitched her Wilderland. And then she was like, okay, let's go. <laughs> that was quite literally how it happened with that. And she works now with me and the whole team, Declan as well there and Lily um, on creating uh, Wilderland and, and we all work together. It's very collaborative. Um, and so there's that side of it because Jo also does tours. So she takes uh, speaking tours and now Wilderland around the country or to wild screen. But Jo, um, in a presenting capacity, she just has been in this industry for a very long time. She's incredibly knowledgeable about um, what uh, people uh, deserve, uh, what people's workload is. Uh, she was a producer on Life of Birds with David Attenborough. She's, a long t she's had a lot of different things in her life that have really positioned her to be able to, make the, to, to help people in this position. You know, from my point of view, as someone who is young, you know, relatively inexperienced in these kinds of things. It's so helpful to have somebody with that level of connection and that understanding of the industry to kind of coach me through it. And that's what I think Joe is brilliant for. And I think as you were saying about how she has, uh, she's a bit of a, there aren't many people doing what she's doing um, in terms of just doing factual television presenters. She's a fantastic coach in how to manage things, who to send certain emails to. And then she deals with the, you know, uh, any sort of money situations so that I don't have to. And I find that a lot better because I love to keep good relationships and great friends and things. And I, um, I think I would struggle if I also had to worry about that all of the time. Yeah, it's so hard because, you know, money is that great kind of level of where it, 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 when you get into those conversations, you know, so much of this industry, when you go to the festivals, you meet everyone. It's like meeting, you know, some of your best friends. It's like going along and just meeting your buddies and hanging out. And when you have to start talking shop and talking, you know, specifically funding and, and money and business, it can really, it, it feels hard for many of us to do that because we're not built in that way. It's so many of us are creative and we have that creative expression we can talk about that until the cows come home um, but once money gets into it it can kind of muddy the waters plus it's always hard based on the fact that there's really no set you know when you're independent it's one of those things you go in you have an idea of money but you know there's there's levels of what you'll take to get something done and so you know it, it's with many of the people i mentor people say to me you know what's the going rate for this and I'm like, you know, it's, it's, it's hard because that's based on so many things, so many different things. But having someone like Joe on your side who has that experience and, you know, can, can handle that for you, I can see is a, is a massive plus. I love the way you said that, you know, she was coming out the building and you just went up to her because I think so many relationships are made that way. Um, you know, you've just got to have... You know, you've got to go, this is it. This is it. Oh, yeah, I just went outside of myself for a second. That's not something I would ever be able to do. But I was just like, nope, you're going to do it. You're going to put on this brain now and you're just going to go. And it was a really good decision. Because um, uh, she is, yes, it was really brilliant. She, I, it was about one of the best decisions I've ever made. And I will add to that as well. It's about, it's another thing. It's about confidence. Because I did some presenting stuff at uni, but really nobody of, you know, any kind of consequence in the industry has ed had ever watched me. So there's yeah. always that kind of niggling feeling in the back of your mind that you're like, are you, are you any good at this? Like, are you actually capable of this whatsoever? And to get somebody like Joe to be like, yeah, you can, gives you the confidence, I think, to then be like, okay, I can, I can pursue this. Um, and I would actually say if anybody does want to be a presenter, um, uh, I can give some advice on show reels as well, because Joe taught me a lot. If you want to send your show reel into Joe, which I would recommend doing, because she is really brilliant, don't put music on it, for one thing. She doesn't like the music. She's like, I want to be able to see, like, as a director or a producer, what I'm getting here. What, and music is often something that, because I always used to put music on. And she's like, why would you do that? Because you, if, if, you can, if you've naturally got the story and able to do it, music is something that hides that or creates an emotion. Um, and I think, yeah, if you just send in your best clips, um, she's always looking for people as well. I think that's so valid because, you know, it's a bit like, you know, if you write a book and you want to bind it to send it to the publisher, you know, they just want to see the words. 
and, you know, and see if they work. And it, it's so important to remember that. And I think, you know, as creators, again, we, we want to see it as best as it can be and pass that on. But in the industry, people aren't worried by that. They, they, as you say, they just want to see you. They want to see how you come across. They know that it goes to another level once music's added and once, you know, production's there and what have you. So that is, that's hugely appealing. And, you know, something else you said I can relate to, gosh, I mean, I, I for probably the best part of 10 years was presenting for National Geographic and, and uh, made m many shows. And at not one point did I ever think I was a good presenter. There was never a moment I turned oh, around, God, wow, I'm really good at this. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought I was terrible at it. And people would say, no, no, it's good. And, and, and you could only go by someone else's point of view because really, I mean, I guess we're all different. It's a subjective thing. But certainly for me, it was something that I, I, I couldn't bear looking at myself on TV. You know, to watch those things, I was just like, oh my gosh, I could have done that better. Or why did I do that? Or, yeah. you, know, <laughs> you know, all of those kind of things. So, so that's good advice. It, it's about, you know, being, letting someone else have a look at your stuff and, and tell you what's working and what's not is so important. And that's a producer's role, of course, on, you know, in any production when there's talent involved. So now, mm -hmm. you, you, as you say, you wear many hats. So you're a presenter you're a camera person, you are um, producing, directing. Out of all of the things that you do, what would you say is your go-to? You know, if, if, you, if someone said to you today, right, from now on you had to do one thing, is there something you could choose to do? Uh, first off, absolutely. Hopefully that won't happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, firstly, never. Um, I love having a diversity of stuff, but I, I love, I, I love to do the producer presenter role. I know that's two things, but it's kind of like me and a friend, a camera operator. I think a camera operator and a producer presenter role is a really cohesive and great relationship. Um, and like what I was doing for Queen of Birds, I wish I could just do that for the rest of my life. I went out with one camera operator, my friend Ben, and um, uh, and I'm about to do another two uh, uh, expedition film, three expedition films in the next sort of six, seven months uh, with another uh, camera to Chris. And that is kind of my, that's when I'm at my absolute happiest, when I'm out on location deciding what the stories are and then just sort of telling the story. Because I think that's what's so beautiful about having a presenter, because you can, it's, it's, a, it's character development. I, I mean, at, at its absolute core, a story is just a character going through change um in any capacity that and i think that's kind of uh, storytelling is my favorite thing it's about stories um i think that's the whole reason i love doing this in the first place i love the reason i love to do talks or to present i just love to tell stories um and anything by which i can do that i think is what, what i would say i'd love to do for the rest of my life um but yeah and even with my phd uh, to me i'm i'm trying to like crowbar story into it right now and the and the uh, my uh, supervisor is like yeah okay. Yeah, yeah, it's a science. <laughs> Get back to the science. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good. Well, let's just stay, stick on presenting for a second because, um, you know, I love the fact you talk about, you know, presenting and producing. And actually, you know, so much of the time, that's what presenters are. I mean, they're taken on in different capacities. Some presenters uh, are very much uh, produced in terms of having written scripts. You know, there's the kind of anchor style presenting where your words are there. You've got to stick to the script. Mm -hmm. But what I really found, you know, so appealing about presenting uh, as I went on through my presenting career was this being out in the field, writing your own work based on the story that's happening there and then. Because it's so much easier in my mind for me to write something and to say it or for me to ad lib about what's going on than to have someone else give me a written script. Because when mm -hmm. someone else gives me a written script, it's not in my words. It's not necessarily yeah. how I would say it. And then it gets stilted. And then, you know, and, and I struggled with that a lot in the early days, having, you know, very stilted on camera stuff because no one wanted me to change the words. But as things went on and I had more control, and that really is that kind of producer, presenter um, um, uh, role, which is, uh, which is, I think, so important in terms of it making a cohesive program and making it more easily watchable mm -hmm. um, in terms of these more stilted ones. So I think that's really important. But let's, let's, let's talk about your, uh, your PhD. So you're embarking on a PhD. Now, I'm fascinated by this because 
one, you know, as you say, we met over uh, Wilderland, your, your festival. My film was in your festival, which I'm honored for. Thank you very um, much for setting it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now, um, and you know, what I love and, and about your festival, what I love about your festival was the fact that they, you picked just a few films. Mm -hmm. With so many of the larger festivals, you know, that they're, they're picking obviously lots and lots of films. They run for a week. They, they show them at different times throughout the week. And there's just a lot. And I mean, I've been to multiple festivals and never, ever seen all the films. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, most of the time you're networking at these festivals. You rarely get a chance to actually go to the films. Um, what I loved about Wilderland is that you literally picked eight films and you made this trailer and all of our films were in the trailer, which was fantastic because so much of the time you're waiting to see the trailer. Oh, oh, and there you go. Oh, my film wasn't in the trailer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, and I love that. What, what was your, um, we'll get back to your PhD in a minute. What was yeah. your, uh, what was your um, when you thought about Wilderland and, and making that festival, you know, what inspired you to do that? Why did you choose the format that you did? Well, I was on that Masters at the time when I founded it with my friend Isaac. And we, um, and Isaac since moved on, he now works at BBC. Um, and I've kind of taken the reins of the festival full time. But um, we kind of had this idea that uh, we were seeing these incredible films come out of just this one student, you know, situation. And we're like, no one's seeing these. You know, they might go onto YouTube and have 200 views, or maybe one of them will go, you know, internet low end viral and reach 500 or 10,000 a push. And we just thought like these are amazing films. And usually what would happen is these filmmakers um, will make, uh, you know, slightly different to yourself actually, because you did want it to go for a more public screening. But a lot of filmmakers, especially, you know, coming out of university or maybe it's their first, second film, they'll make it for the industry and they'll create the film and they'll send it to get a job in wildlife television. And actually I think that's a sad place for those films because they're great and they're really engaging. And actually outside of, you know, the typical commissioning restraints, these are personal stories by independent filmmakers that have had no restraints over how they tell their story. And I think that what we thought was just like the way that BAMP Film Festival does it or the Ocean Film Festival World Tour. We thought what a great way to, to combine film festivals, but make it outside the industry um, and make it into an events company that tours multiple theatres and you get people from the public to come and engage with these films. Everyone loves wildlife film, you know. The David Attenborough is the most watched television event in the UK every year, but there is no touring wildlife film festival like these other ones that are going around. And people would love something like that. And, and that's why it kind of, and that's where it all it came from. Um, and we picked our first date in 2019 that we toured around 26 cities around the UK and it was really brilliant. Um, and that's and I think that's what it's all about for us. It's getting those stories that wouldn't typically be seen by the public because they'd never search for something like that out um, into these big uh, theatres uh, and show the diversity of the world in so many different ways. One of the films we had in our first year was by an amazing filmmaker called Annie Moyer. There was no music throughout the entire film. It was told in a way that you would never see on television or terrestrial ever. Um, it was very artistic and it was, the, the voices of whales and cetaceans in the ocean and how traffic of boats coming over is disrupting uh, the way that they are speaking to one another, communicating and living their lives. Um, and the way that she did it is she got this incredible sound designer, Dan Pollard, and they collaborated to make these black, uh, great big black planes of water with subwoofers underneath and played whales calls. And they go, and then they play this on the top. It's really beautiful. And then we'd selected that film. It was really great. And then fast forward a few months and it uh, won at Jackson Wild, um, which was really, really cool and amazing to see Annie going up there and, exp and, and, and collecting her award for emerging talent. Um, but I think it's just, it's, it's getting those films out to the public. Because even within that industry in Jackson Wild, Annie wasn't getting that film to the public. And now people all over the UK have engaged with that film. And um, I think that's what it was all about for us. Yeah, that's so important and it's, it's fantastic to have a festival like that and you having created that for those films. Because as you say, you know, in this day and age, there are films being put on YouTube, you know, every second, tens of thousands probably every second. And, and it's finding a way to get a voice for those films um, that they can get just lost in the noise of everything else going on. So that's so incredibly important. And, and again, thank you for that. You know, it's, um, I think that's well worthwhile. And I think, you know, this year, you guys did an incredible job of really pulling, you know, a rabbit out of a hat in terms of the way all of the festivals did. You know, the pandemic really 
changed everything, you know, and uh, put everything viral, uh, sorry, uh, virtual, um, and has created a different world for us, and, you know, for, for good and for bad. So, um, uh, you know, we're impressed how everyone coped with the situation um, and still made it happen, which is fantastic. Well, we were so lucky, though, our first bit, I'll just say we were, for yeah. this year, I think we'd, we'd moved our dates around so much. So we were due to go on this big, you know, 30 city tour this year. And we had uh, Bristol. So we got the whole industry in the theater and we got to do all of these beautiful films from this year, um, including yours in uh, the Bristol 1532, beautiful, amazing theater. And then just right before lockdown, we had the Royal Geographical Society in London. Um, and, we, and it was like, there were 500 people there. It was really, it was a really special night. Um, and we had some, some of our judges were there as well. And it was, yeah, that was really great. And then lockdown after that, but it, what, a, what a place to have got before we- um, before Absolutely, we yeah, no, absolutely, that's fantastic. Well, let, let's move on to your PhD and um, just talk a little bit. I, I, you know, what amazes me, I know having lived with my wife through PhD, right? <laughs> I know how hard PhD can be. And, um, you know, you sound like an extremely busy person. You know, you've got productions on the go. You've got a, a, you know, you're the founder of a film festival. Uh, you, you know, you're a, you're a presenter, you're a director, you're a cameraman, you're pr producing these things. It's a lot of work. How on earth are you fitting in PhD with all of that on your plate? If you want something done, ask a busy man, Jake. That's what right. I say. <laughs> no, no, I have no idea is the answer to that. Um, uh, I, it all happened off the back of Queen of Birds, actually, because I've always stayed in touch with my uh, supervisors from uni. And, um, you know, I, it's, that's where this, all the best stories are coming out of. Um, but I was out there and I was interested because, you know, that in, a, in terms of war, especially armed conflict, we always think about how much it's damaging wildlife populations and largely armed conflicts directly damage wildlife populations and that is across the board but I was in the Philippines and seeing uh, in Mindanao Island where there's you know a lot of orange political red zones with the Abu Saif ISIS affiliate group as well as you know the rebel, uh, uh, against the government rebels and in those areas in Mindanao there were more Philippine eagles because people are scared to go in those areas because there's less um, uh, palm oil plantation less banana plant uh, plantations and that was kind of interesting to me because I'm like oh that's kind of interesting that conflict has basically saved this critically endangered animal in certain areas and I was thinking if there is if there were less if there was less activity like that would that be better for the eagles would they still be alive today um, and then I thought, thought about it a bit more and my friend Catalina Aristizabal who's now at BBC she's Colombian uh, wildlife uh, filmmaker made a brilliant film about hippos it's on our uh, Worldline TV if you fancy watching it. But she was telling me that in Colombia, guerrilla warfare has protected huge tracts of forest from, uh, from poaching, from plantations. And now that, uh, that some of that is diminishing, people are going in and finding brand new species and, you know, in, in their tens. Um, and, uh, and while conflict very largely is bad for populations, I just thought what an interesting kind of thing to look at because then it started to open up the doors to looking at places like the DMZ, the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea, which has, you know, some of the last populations of Amur tigers, Amur leopards, bears. Um, but what a strange kind of war created habitat that is in otherwise two very built up countries. Um, and then uh, the flip side is Vietnam, which has some of the highest biodiversity in the entire world, one of the planet's most biodiverse countries. But in terms of abundance, it's incredibly low. And a large proportion of that was because when the American troops came in the Vietnam War, they were so afraid of the Viet Cong uh, that because of their traps and, and their ingenious ways to kind of hide in the forests. They were small, so they could hide underneath these little trap doors and come up and shoot people. Terrifying. So they napalmed huge tracts of forest in Vietnam. They used the Langer monkeys, now critically endangered red shanked and grey shanked dukes, as target practice. Um, and that's kind of had an on, uh, a knock on effect. In Laos and Cambodia, there's so many mines in the woods that have blown off the legs of elephants. And there's, um, on the flip side of that, there's men now, there's people um, in uh, Cambodia, this, this guy building prosthetic legs for elephants that have stood on mines. Um, but it's just all of this stuff. I think it's a really interesting scientific study of what different kinds of conflict uh, can have 
differential effects on wildlife populations? And can we learn from looking at a sort of meta-analysis of the world of what kinds of conflicts happen in certain areas that when something does start to arise, we know what type of conflict it is, the way that it's being managed, and is there something that we could learn from previous situations, historically and presently, that we could apply to um, to mitigate as much wildlife loss as possible? And that's kind of my thought process in it. Um, and of course, it will adapt and change over the long period that I'm doing it because it is not a full time PhD. That would be quite literally impossible. I'm doing it hopefully over about eight years. Right. I mean, it, it sounds incredible. Absolutely incredible. I mean, a vast thing to take on. But, um, you know, I'm sure, you know, what, I mean, what, what's fascinating, I mean, hearing what you've already done and what you're doing now, I'm sure you're going to make something out of it in terms of filming it all along the way, I'm assuming, yes, as, well as, as well as the study. So, um, I mean, that's going to be incredible to keep, keep our eyes on and, and see what comes from that. Um, because, yeah, I don't think anything has been done like that before. I mean, I've never heard of any kind of studies like that uh, to do with war zones. So, um, well, there was a there was one amazing PhD study done from the periods of um, I think it was uh, obviously it didn't start then, but it was done from the d data from 1944 to 2010, specifically in sub-Saharan Africa, um, and that's a really interesting one to like draw from. But a global meta-analysis, I've not seen it. So, yeah, that's amazing. Well, Dan, you've got your hands full. <laughs> you've got your hands full. It's, I mean, it's incredible. You know, what I've loved about chatting with you today is that I've not been able to keep on track of which way we're going to go because you've got so many things happening. Like, let's talk about this first, and then we'll get back to that, <laughs> which is always, which is always fantastic. Look, I, you know, you've, th this has been so valuable for our listeners. What I want to do is round it out by just asking you one last piece of advice because, um, you know, really that's what this is all about. And if you had to give one last piece of advice to our listeners, aspiring wildlife filmmakers, you know, mm. from whatever, what is probably the most valuable piece of advice you could have in terms of them pursuing this industry as a whole, whether that's as a career or as a passion, mm. what would you say? We actually had this, com this uh, question at Wildscreen. Um, and I think, and that was for, it was more specifically about presenting, but I think it goes across all areas of it. It's just to remember exactly why you wanted to do it in the first place, which is really probably because you love animals and you love adventures and you can, and I think just to remember all of that and to cherish all of that and all of this, the, you know, the bull that comes uh, on the other side, just forget about it. And if one thing doesn't work out, go and do your own adventures and film them. And, uh, and, 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 that's, and, and that's so beautiful about the world that we're in now because we have so much freedom to create and do stuff on our own. Um, but to remember why you, you love it. I think. Yeah, I think that's very valuable. And enjoy the journey because at the end of the day, as you say, that's why most people get into this is because of loving what they're doing. And it can so easily, once you get busy and things pile up, it can become a chore. And I think mm. it's so, so easy to forget why you got into it. And I think that's so valuable. Dan, thank you so much for being with us today. I really appreciate it. Where can people find you? This, you can tell us now, give us the tags to your social media, wherever that's they can find you, and I'll put them on the website as well. Thank you very much. Well, um, if you want to find out about the film festival, Wilderland Film Festival, and um, submit your film for 2021, where our submissions are now open, um, and that's uh, www.wilderlandfestival.com. Uh, we're also on YouTube uh, at Wilderland TV. Uh, you can type that in. If you can find my my film is called Queen of Birds, um, and uh, and on Instagram, if you want to follow me specifically, uh, I mean, it might not be that interesting because it's you know just my day to day life, but uh, I'm Dan O Wild on uh, on Instagram. As well. Awesome, Dan. You, you, hey, you're going to get lots of people following you. It's extremely interesting. You've got so much going on. It's fascinating. What I love about speaking with someone like yourself is that, you know, you are, you've got all of these facets going on at once. And, um, you know, these are, all of the roles you've taken on are extremely hard on their own. I mean, producing, directing, camera person, presenting all of those things are hard roles to take on and to do it all in one package and do it successfully is is a huge achievement so i wish you all the success for the future and uh, with your phd can't wait to see what happens there and um and thank you again for being with us thank you for having me i can't wait to follow your journey uh, and, I can and continue to do so as well so thank you very much awesome thanks then cheers if you've enjoyed this episode of the master wildlife filmmaking podcast then please leave a rating and a comment. And remember to subscribe to keep up to date with the series' future episodes.
You can find out more information about wildlife filming at jakewillers.com. And if you're interested in starting a career in the wildlife filmmaking industry or being mentored to further your career, then please visit jakewillers.com forward slash mentorship. Thanks for listening.